Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're very glad that you could join us tonight. I am Gail Coza. I am a member of the Board of Directors for the American Cetacean Society San Francisco Bay Chapter. And I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series. Founded in 1967, the American Cetacean Society is the oldest whale conservation nonprofit on the planet. We protect and conserve whales, dolphins, and porpoises and their habitats through public education, research grants, and conservation actions. As part of our education programs, we offer this monthly speaker series, which features experts from around the world who bring you the most up-to-date information about whales, dolphins, porpoises, the marine and riverine ecosystems they inhabit, and more. This series features renowned scientists, conservationists, authors, photographers, filmmakers, and students who all share a common interest in conserving and protecting these creatures and their habitats. This event and all of our programs are fully funded by individual donations from our community. If you would like to make a donation or become a member, please visit our website at acs-sfbay.org. We are grateful for your support. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Scott Benson, uh, lead investigator of the Leatherback Turtle Ecology Program at NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center. He's stationed at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, and he coordinates studies of the distribution, abundance, and movement patterns, foraging ecology, and health of endangered Western Pacific leatherback turtles along the US West Coast and throughout the Pacific. His research integrates biotelemetry, aerial surveys, vessel-based sampling, and satellite remote sensing to enhance understanding of how oceanographic processes influence the occurrence and behavior of this species and to aid US and international conservation and recovery efforts. Scott's presentation titled, Welcome Back Leatherbacks, will discuss the biology and ecology of leatherback turtles, including information specific to the endangered Western Pacific population that utilizes the US West Coast waters as a foraging region. The presentation will also include the current status of the population, challenges to recovery, and actions that citizens might take to enhance recovery prospects. Scott, welcome. Oh, and I forgot to introduce as well, we have as panelist, uh, Bob Wilson, who is a co-board member along with me for the American Cetacean Society. Welcome, Bob. And welcome, Scott, I will hand off to you. And you're on mute, Scott. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. We just lost the connection there for a little bit. So um, hopefully we will be able to stay with you the whole time. Um, yeah, I'm out here in Moss Landing. And so we don't necessarily have some of the infrastructure you all have over there in um, the city. Anyway, right. as, well, as thank you. As Gail mentioned, I'm with the, the Southwest Fishery Science Center and I'm located in Moss Landing where I'm also a research affiliate. I've also been, we've also been partnering partnering lately with a uh, NGO located in Monterey called Upwell. They've become really good partners. So a little bit more about myself. I started out as a tuna dolphin observer back in the 1980s. Um, little did I know when I was 25 years old that I was going to be witnessing the very beginnings of globalization and its impact on fisheries and, uh, and protection of uh, uh, marine mammals in this case. And, and other uh, marine species. Um, things have changed quite a bit uh, since that time, but it's really kind of helped shape my, um, my perspective on uh, marine science and marine conservation. So here's the outline of what I'll speak about today, uh, a little bit about biology, about leatherbacks. I figure that although you're probably a fairly sophisticated audience, you may not know leatherback turtles very well. Um, we'll talk about their range and population status and some of the science efforts that have been going on both current and past. Um, the leatherback is known as a species in the spotlight by NOAA because it's in danger of extinction within the next 30 years. 
and we'll talk i'll talk also about how we might be able to uh, enhance recovery prospects for the species so the leatherback is a very unique animal it's the largest turtle in the world second largest reptile only some large saltwater crocodiles are bigger um, can weigh up to 2,000 pounds. That animal on the top is Archelon. That was the predecessor to the leatherback. And that animal there was on the order of 12 to 18 feet long. Huge, huge creature. Um, it does not have a hard shell. It has a, a carapace that's covered in skin. So if you scratch it, it would actually bleed. Um, this is actually an advantage to this type of this animal because it's capable of diving to some great depths and having a flexible shell allows compression at depth. It's got a very high growth rate due to its high vascularization. This makes the animal very difficult to age by using bones uh, like a uh, humerus, which is used typically with most of the other hard shell species. Um, so in this case, to age a leatherback, you actually have to recover a dead animal and get little bones behind the eye, eye ossicles that aren't vascularized. So you can do the same type of, um, of uh, measurements of rings in the bones to estimate age. But uh, age is, aging of leatherbacks is still um, evolving as a science. It's got the most extensive range of any living reptile. And I'll explain that in a little bit why that is. Although the nesting itself is confined to tropical latitudes. Now I say it's the oldest sea turtle. This animal can go back, we can go back as far as 80 million years with this particular animal in its present form. Um, and it has survived meteor strikes, climate changes, ice ages, all kinds of different things, and still manages to keep going. It's, uh, it's got some pretty clever tricks. So the reason it's got such a wide range is because this animal is actually, that's wrong, it's an old slide. It's not endothermic, it is a mesotherm. And so what that means, an endotherm is like us, humans, and other reptiles are your classic cold-blooded ectotherms where they're the same temperature as their environment. But leatherback is actually able to maintain a body temperature greater than its environment. Um, part of this is due to its large size. It does have a, a, blubber, a little bit of blubber. It's got countercurrent circulatory system that you might be familiar with with some of the marine mammals. And it's also able to change its behavior um, by with in particularly its diving behavior. So although out here in California, we have cold water out here in Central California, Northern California, that's not favorable to any of the other hard shelled turtles. It's only the leatherback that is a constituent of the California current from the sea turtle group. Um, but in other places, this animal is more in danger of overheating. And so in places like in the tropics, for instance, where it's nesting, they will spend greater time at depth to cool themselves down and they'll change their dive shape in order to regulate their body temperature. So it's really an interesting animal that is also able to create its own metabolic heat through its behavior. In this case, it's working, it's diving, it's swimming, and it's able to generate heat that way. Truly unique among, among the reptiles. Um, as I mentioned, it can dive to great depth, so that flexible carapace is helpful to that. Um, it's got a, the, the, the carapace is shaped as a kind of a teardrop, so it's very hydrodynamic. Um, and it does all this stuff on a diet of gelatinous zooplankton. So in this case, jellies and salps, tunicates. Um, and so to look at this in this way, this is a, we call it a, a gelatinous zooplankton specialist or a jelly jellyvore or however you'd want to talk about it and inside that mouth you see those throat papillae they look pretty fearsome um, they're not hard they're actually flexible um, but it's a great little uh, adaptation to keep you know if you've ever been around jellyfish you know they're kind of slimy keep that stuff moving down the esophagus down to the stomach. And uh, so if I was to put my hand in there, it wouldn't tear it up like uh, a garbage disposal or anything like that, but it does work very well for keeping jellies going down. And hence it's a specialist, just like you're probably familiar with blue whales and the type of baleen that they have that enables them to going, you know, eating krill. So 
is a little bit about leatherback turtle life history. Um, these animals use tropical beaches to lay their eggs. Um, each turtle will lay anywhere from three to maybe 10 clutches of eggs at about a nine to 10 day interval. So this will take several months for a female to lay all the eggs that she's got. Each clutch of eggs is probably around seven to 90 eggs. And it requires about 70 days for them to incubate in the sand at these tropical beaches. And then these, these little turtles come out and they're about the size of a silver dollar and head for the water immediately. And for the males, that'll be the only time that they ever interact with land. They are, these are real sea turtles. They spend all their time at sea with only the females coming back to land to lay eggs. Eventually they find foraging grounds around the Pacific Ocean. In this case, we've got one right here off the coast of San Francisco between Monterey and, and Point, um, Point Reyes is really kind of the heartland of that area. And they will sit, stay there for the, the whole foraging season, which is about, about right now, they'll be showing up right around the 4th of July and stay around until November and do nothing but eat jellyfish. There's no mating that happens here or anything like that. They're just here to eat jellyfish. And when they're ready, they'll go back to the nesting beaches. Now they don't go back to the nesting beaches every year. It's really on the order of every three to five years. So that's what we call the internesting interval or the remigration interval. And, it, and so these animals aren't going back and forth every year like you know, the, the large marine mammals do, for instance. So it's a little different that way. And it makes it very difficult, frankly, to um, estimate abundance uh, out here on the um, foraging grounds and at the, at the nesting beaches, because you know you're never seeing the whole population at one time. Leatherbacks are distributed throughout the world's oceans and the uh, Atlantic, Indian, and, and Pacific Oceans. As you can see here, some of the populations are still quite large, including like particularly the Northwest Atlantic population um, and the Southeast Atlantic population that nests off Africa. The only, th the only uh, unfortunate thing about this information here is that all these populations, despite their size, are exhibiting um, signs of decline. So that is un the unfortunate part about that. We use multiple techniques here in our our area here off the US West Coast to study leatherbacks, including genetics and satellite telemetry is a big one. Aerial surveys, we won't be able to do anything without aerial surveys because these animals are rare and cryptic and we need airplanes to be able to find them. Uh, we engage in oceanographic sampling and prey sampling and remote sensing as well. That animal there at the bottom right is the third largest one we ever caught. It weighs 607 kilograms, so about 1,300 pounds. So we'll confine the rest of the, the today's discussion to nesting in the, or excuse me, the populations in the Pacific, the major nest, uh, major leatherback populations in the Pacific. And over here we've got two populations. One is called the eastern, we call the eastern Pacific population that nests in the eastern Pacific, and. This might be the population that most people might be familiar with because um, maybe they've been in Mexico or Costa Rica to see nesting animals. And then there's also one in the Western Pacific that's using these island nations of the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Papua Bharat uh, in Indonesia, which is on the Western half of the island of New Guinea. There used to be a population in Malaysia. It's now extinct. It was over 10,000 animals at one point. Um, it's it's a pretty sad story, but uh, essentially the uh, Malaysian government institutionalized collecting eggs on behalf of everybody else. So they were going to collect the eggs and distribute them out to people as needed. They figured they would leave, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the eggs in the in the beach in order to keep the population viable. And of course, that that's kind of silly when you think about it. Um, if a leatherback could have got away with laying 80% less eggs a long time ago, they would have done that. Um, so that kind of institutionalizing of egg collection, and then also at the same time, gillnet fisheries adjacent to the beach quickly caused that population to collapse. So there was, it was getting pressure from both sides, both recruitment 
by having these eggs being collected and not, you know, lo loss of hatchlings. And then also this pressure on these nesting females that were coming back to the beach and getting caught in these fisheries. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a good lesson to stay aware about and, you know, provide some motivation that it hopefully won't happen to these other populations. Now, if I go back, I'll go back to that. We also, we differentiate these populations by their genetics. So in this case, it's the mitochondrial DNA that's dif differentiating Western Pacific animals from Eastern Pacific animals. So they are actually different. And there's actually a little different in size too. The Eastern Pacific stock is a slightly smaller animal compared to the Western Pacific. And if we look at telemetry, we also see this uh, corroborated, if you will, or reflected in the telemetry, whereby the Eastern Pacific stock is using waters off of uh, South America, so off the coast of Chile and Peru, whereas the Western Pacific stock is radiating out throughout various parts of the Pacific Ocean, and I will show you more here. So this population is unique because it's the only one, only leatherback population in the world that actually has two nesting seasons. It's got a bimodal pattern. One peak occurs during July and the other peak occurs during January, February. And so I've got these in different colors here to show that these are animals that I put transmitters on. And the red ones were from the summer nesting group and the blue ones were from the winter nesting group. And then the greens are animals that I've caught here off the coast of California and put transmitters on. And what you'll see first and foremost out of this is that Turtles that nest during the winter use the Southern Hemisphere for foraging areas exclusively. Whereas those that nest during the summertime are using the Northern Hemisphere exclusively. And you might be wondering, because I do, I did, why is that the case? Why would this be separated like this? And it has to do with what happens to these animals when they're little hatchlings. So what you see here on the, on the left panel, are one year long trajectories of hatchlings released from either um, Jamors fumetti, which you can see my cur cursor is over here, or in this case, Kamiali, Papua New Guinea down here. And what happens is that there is a shift in what's known as the New Guinea coastal current, and it shifts with the monsoons. So when the monsoon winds come and they change direction, it changes the direction of that coastal current. So it, the hatchlings that come out of these little, of these nest chambers and hit the water, if they hit the water during the July, August time, they're gonna be pushed northward. If they hit the water during January, February, they're gonna be pushed southward. And so that's what starts this whole thing off. But still, it's not the whole story. So. It, what we have here is we call the learned migration hypothesis. So as I said, these little hatchings are gonna come off the beach and they're gonna be moved either north or south, depending on what time of year it is and what direction the North New Guinea coastal current is moving. And most of them will go out and die because they won't be able to find any food and they'll starve or they'll become prey to other animals. So, you know, a leatherback, let's say if it lays, you know, 10 clutches of 70 eggs, you know, maybe that's 700. Out of that, maybe we think, we really don't know for sure that maybe one out of those 700 would actually live to be a reproductive adult. So those that do live to be reproductive adults, they've identified a foraging ground. They have survived and identified a foraging ground. And some of these are far away, like the one in California, which is the most distant foraging ground for this population but there are other foraging grounds throughout the Pacific. And they come back as adults to, mate, to lay eggs on the beach and mate offshore. And <clears throat> they come from these different foraging grounds to, at this one area of unification, which is the nesting beach. So this obviously makes the nesting beaches extremely important and the waters adjacent to the nesting beach is very important because it's used by the entire population. Of course, their eggs will hatch and their, 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 the hatchlings will go to some other place. So it, it's quite possible that a leatherback, for instance, that's using California as a foraging ground 
would have a progeny that ends up using the South China Sea as a foraging ground. So these are connected. This, this, uh, this migration pattern isn't um, inherited. It is, it is regulated by ocean conditions. And so it's kind of a, there's a little bit of randomness involved in this thing, but it also, in, it also it makes it very important um, that we recognize that it's all connected and that if we have losses of animals, for instance, in the South China Sea, it's likely to impact the numbers that we also see off California. So this is what the Western Pacific population looks like. We call this a meta population using multiple foraging grounds and nesting at multiple different beaches in the Western Pacific. I mentioned about the winter and the summer nesters in this case and the green ones. And then down here in the inset here are the places where these animals were tagged. And these are the foraging areas that they're using. So what, we're, what I've done here is we're using what's known as area restricted search behavior. So we've got a transmitter on an animal and we're looking at how frequently it turns and how frequently it changes its speed. So an animal is turning frequently and changing its speed frequently is engaged in what we call area restricted search or foraging. And those are in these areas that have been circled here in gold or in the, uh, the darker colors. So here's the South China Sea. We've got the North Pacific Transition Zone, California Current, um, down here in the wintertime off the coast of Australia, off New Zealand, some of them just around the corner in some Indonesian seas. These are very diverse habitats. Some are coastal and shallow, like California, for instance, or in the South China Sea. Some are out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and over deep waters. Some are temperate, again, like California or down off of New Zealand and Australia. And some are completely tropical, South China Sea or these Indonesian seas. What unifies these places is uh, that there are physical mechanisms in each of these places that help to aggregate jellyfish. So even though it's not you know, a uniform, like, oh, it's a specific temperature or a, sp a specific chlorophyll content or something like that, it's really about what's happening with, is it sea surface height that's aggregating these animals or frontal regions that's aggregating these jellies, again, that make these places have some kind of commonality in that they have mechanisms in place to help aggregate jellies. And, you know, jellies are not a real high, high quality uh, food item as you'll see later here. So leatherbacks have to eat a lot of them. So they have to find places where there are really dense quantities of jellies. And we talk about California leatherbacks. This is, again, the migration across from the, the nesting beaches to uh, California. This is the longest migration of any air breathing aquatic vertebrate. And what I mean by that is that yes, there are birds that go further like the Arctic tern, but they're flying. Um, there are, are some whale sharks that might go as far, or maybe a little further, but they don't ever have to come up for air. The leatherback turtle is actually pushing water across the entire Pacific Ocean. It requires them on the order of uh, 10 to 12 months to make the journey from the nesting beaches over here to California. Uh, the, the trip back is, is shorter, likely because they're in better body condition after gorging on jellyfish for months. Um, and so that they can get back in about seven to nine months. But the dominant pattern in all this is actually that green arrow here, which is, again, I mentioned before that these animals go back to engage in reproductive activities every three to five years. So what happens in between is they'll come out of here, out of California, usually leaving around late November, early December, over winter out here in the Eastern tropical Pacific, and then start moving their, on their way back to uh, the California current in March. And that's the dominant pattern, as you'd expect if you're only gonna nest every three to five years. Right here off Central California is really the hot spot, as I mentioned, between Point Reyes and uh, Monterey Bay. This is a slightly dated uh, uh, figure, but nevertheless, it shows that there's some variability interannually 
with regards to the distribution of animals. Um, we haven't been seen as many in Monterey Bay lately, except for, you know, in July lately. And this is potentially a, a consequence of the population declining. As I mentioned, May to November is when the, the main time is, and I usually get reports of animals around 4th of July. It's shelf habitat. So leatherbacks are really kind of renowned for being this pelagic species, and, and rightly so. They're moving all the way across the ocean. But when it comes to foraging, they're centered on the 50 meter isobath. So this is relatively shallow water. And they're spending most of their time in the upper 20 meters of the water column to, to get these jellyfish. So they're not engaged in really uh, deep diving when they're foraging here. Water temperature is about 15 to 17 degrees. So kind of in the slightly warmer parts, the, you know, slightly warmer pools, if you will, but certainly not what you would consider tropical waters. And even 15 to 17 is going to be way too cold for a hard shell turtle. And these areas are known as retention areas or upwelling shadows. And this also helps uh, accumulate or uh, concentrate prey. So we have tremendous abundance of jellyfish here on the central California coast. And the topography of the coastline helps make that happen. So in this case, the upwelling shadows that you get off of uh, Point Reyes, for instance, where it's blocking some of the wind and makes this area a retention zone. Likewise, down here in North Monterey Bay um, acts as a retention area. Um, also, I would say that the, like to add that the, the thermocline is also a, one of these physical aggregation mechanisms whereby the jellies are usually sitting right around the top of the thermocline. So this is an example of what this that is. So on the top there, you've got a, an acoustic signal. And uh, so you can see where, where this bracket is. This is where the, the jellies are. And kind of blown this up here to show you. These yellow uh, lines here are a dive profile of a leatherback with a time depth recorder on it. This is a blow up of that. And we can see here that what the animal is doing, it's diving down just penetrating the thermocline and then coming back up and getting these jellies on the way up. So they're essentially using light to silhouette the jellies as they come back up from a dive to grab these, these jellies here. And you see it's not very deep again, and it's catching these jellies at the top of the thermocline. I mentioned they have to eat a lot of jellies. And that's because it is, it's a poor, it's a poor energy item. It's uh, re relatively low caloric content. So we've done some uh, work to estimate caloric content of these jellies. And the greatest one is the sea nettle. Um, and you probably see, if you go out in the water much, you might see these animals, they're quite abundant. Um, they have a much higher caloric content than a moon jelly, which leatherbacks are also seen eating moon jellies from time to time. And they can be quite abundant also. But, if we do this little back of the envelope calculation, it comes out to about 100 to 270 kilograms of, of jellies per day, depending on the prey item. So if you're going to eat sea nettles, maybe you only need about 100. If you're going to eat moon jellies, you're going to need to eat a lot more, about 275 kilograms. So this is 25 to 68 percent of their body mass in sea jellies every day to meet their maintenance costs and even more to have growth and be able to engage in reproductive activities, even if it's every three to five years. Oh, and by the way, that picture, that is a snapshot from our airplane. And that is, those are all jellies. So all those white dots there are moon jellies. And if you look really closely at the picture, you'll notice that there's some red ones in there as well. They just don't have the same kind of contrast. So. This kind of thing will go on for miles and miles. And we've said to ourselves often, if we fell out of the plane, we wouldn't even hit the water. We'd just land on jellies. Recently, we published a uh, article uh, in 2020 in Global Ecology and Conservation about the trend that we've, we've noticed here in California. And so this is from our aerial surveys dating back to 1989. My wife, Karen Forney, actually started this. She was doing uh, surveys for Harbor Porpoise and asked somebody at the time, um, 
hey, I'm seeing these leatherback turtles. Do you want me to record these? And people said, yes, please, please do so. Keep, keep doing that. And so we kept it going. I, I got and started getting involved in 2000. And during that time now, we can see this trend in abundance off the foraging ground here. So we've got, we've, de we've essentially documented an 80% decline in the number of turtles at the foraging ground from 1990 to 2017. So that's a 5.6% decline every year. Inside this figure here, you'll see this gray line. That's data from the nesting beach. So where they're counting nesting females. And we also see a similar decline in this case, 78% from 1984 to 2011, a 5.9% decline per year. So it's bad news. From a science perspective, it's nice that we have this agreement. Um, if you see something like that from just one side or the other, you know, the, just the foraging ground, somebody might say, well, how do you know that they just didn't move some other place and, and therefore you don't, you're not seeing as many as you used to? But at the nesting beach, they've gotten the same signal that this population is in decline and it at risk of extinction within the next 30 years. Now, I mentioned, so people will ask, what about maybe there's not as many jellies? Well, in this figure here, we can see that abundance of jellies was essentially no different, really, during 2010 through 2015 than it was earlier. Um, so I've got this uh, by 1990 through 2002 and then 2005 to 2016. And you can see, actually, that during the period in uh, 2010 through 2014, we had quite a, a high abundance of jellies. And right now, the number of jellies has actually gone back up again. It's actually off this chart. It's, it's up here now. So this, this figure is also getting a little dated. But the bottom line here is that there's no evidence of a long-term decrease in the primary prey availability. There's still plenty of sea nettles for these animals to eat. And we also see this with regards to another gelatinous zooplankton consumer. In this case, it's the mola mola, the ocean sunfish. Now, lately, we're seeing a lot of these animals out here. Um, this is a picture of us trying to catch a leatherback turtle again up here at the top. And we had to cut out this large mola mola. You can see they look fairly similar in their size and color. Um, notably, this mola mola is defecating here, um, sea nettles. So they're eating the, some of the same prey items. And when we look at mola molas, in this case here, in this figure, I've got mola molas in blue, leatherback turtles and red stars. And we can see, we see quite a few of these large mola molas. I've only plotted the big ones. And these are animals that are on the order of over four feet in length. So four feet plus the big ones. And you can see that they overlap quite well with leatherbacks. But Despite the fact that leatherbacks have declined, the molas have remained very abundant. And as we have kind of a leatherback to mola ratio, molas are up as leatherbacks are going down. So we're going to do some more analysis with this in the future. But again, it's another example that, um, yeah, the trend that we're seeing is real. It's not just a, a, a consequence of a change in habitat. Looking at it all together, this is the Pacific Ocean uh, populations. I've got the Malaysian population, as I mentioned here, extinct. These are the populations in gray from the Eastern Pacific, so Mexico and Costa Rica. And you see they're basically banging on the x-axis on this thing. And then here's our guys in red, the Western Pacific population. They, there is an opportunity for them to recover, but we're getting short on time. And now you might have heard about this animal. This is a survivor. This is Bumpy. Bumpy is a male leatherback that we first saw and caught and tagged in 2016. And then again, just recently, this last October in October 2021. His name is Bumpy because his carapace is somewhat uh, deformed. It looks like he has had a run in with a boat or two over time, but he survived the wounds, but his carapace is a little bit bumpy, hence the name. And these are his tracks. And you can see in these cases here, they're fairly similar tracks. 
Um, it's great to see that Bumpy's still out there and able to survive this despite the, the plight of the population, although a little concerning that this last time um, he stopped transmitting in late March, whereas previously we got signals all the way into late July. So we hope Bumpy is okay, but it's just, it's a, it's kind of an inspiration really to see one of these animals multiple times. Really interesting to catch the animal in the same place uh, in twice. So leatherbacks have, there's a lot of threats to leatherbacks on land at sea, direct harvest of eggs and adults on the beaches. There is one fishery for leatherbacks in the K Islands of Indonesia. It's kind of a traditional fishery where they use small boats, small sailboats. It's amazing. I've been out there. It's amazing they can find these animals with no GPS or any kind of you know uh, modern technology. It's highly ritualized hunt. Um, they claim they are actually descendants of leatherbacks themselves, and they get on the bow of the small panga and they'll yell out, "Oh, leatherback, give yourself to us. We are starving." And they catch these animals and they eat them. Um, but that's pretty unusual situation. Generally, most folks won't eat leatherback turtles because they're not very, they don't taste good, I guess, and they smell awful, I can tell you that. Um, but there's always probably a someplace anywhere where somebody want to eat it. Um, introduced predators, pigs and dogs create havoc at the nests and beaches. Coastal development at some of the other areas, like for instance, Costa Rica, um, where you know these really nice beaches that leatherbacks have are places where people want to put their houses and resorts. Fishery bycatch is the biggest one, biggest problem. Marine debris and pollution is, is an issue. Climate change, it is now only because the population has declined so far. In the past, leatherbacks, when the population was robust, they had all kinds of neat little tricks to get around climate change. But now, because the population is so reduced, it's, it's going to be a problem for them. Mentioned that leatherbacks are a species in the spotlight for NOAA, one of eight species considered most likely at risk of extinction in the near future. These are the five top recovery actions. And I'm going to just go through these uh, uh, next. So. Priority action number one, reduce fishery interactions. Leatherbacks are primarily interacting with swordfish fisheries, swordfish and tuna. And swordfish and tuna are caught usually either with a pelagic long line, like you see up here, where you've got all these hooks hanging off these, this line here. And this line can be upwards of 20 miles long. The other way people catch these things are with drift gill nets. And so off the coast of California, we still have a drift gill net fishery, although it's being phased out now, both by the state and federal uh, actions are phasing out this drift gill net fishery. And you can see that it's not a very selective way of fishing. Uh, pretty much anything that comes into it's gonna interact with it. They also can interact with coastal gill net and fixed gear fishery. So like, it doesn't happen a lot. It's kind of, it's very infrequent, but for instance, the Dungeness crab fishery or ground fish fisheries, that use fixed gear also have a probability of interacting with leatherback turtles. Although nothing is bad as the, nothing as frequent as the long line and the drift gill net fisheries. So, but these threats in US fisheries are declining and very well monitored. So in this figure on the left, the red area here is what's known as the Pacific Leatherback Conservation Area. And this area was, is established from 15 August through 15 November meaning that it's a static air fishing area closure. So nobody could be fishing for leather, uh, for excuse me, swordfish with drift gill nets in this area between 15 August to 15 November. Now, it turned out to be extremely successful for leatherbacks, but it came at a, a great cost to the fishery in terms of opportunity to use that area. Also on this figure I'm sh I've shown here in the cross hatches here where we have uh, critical habitat designated for leatherbacks. And that occurred fairly recently in 2012. Um, you can see they're fairly large areas. Now, to address this lack of opportunity for fishing out here and to help supply, you know, meet the demand for swordfish in the United States, we need to think of a better way of doing this and having a static 
closed area, which especially this one is very, as you can see, is very large. And to do that requires what's known now as ocean, dynamic ocean management. And so in this figure here, there's a little abstract here, but essentially what we've done is we've used our telemetry data, the folks have processed it to create models to find out, okay, in this case, is there a temperature affinity out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? This product was made for the um, Hawaii longline fishery. And it essentially came up with these areas, Z1, Z2, Z3, are areas to avoid. Don't put your gear and your long lines in that area because you're more likely to catch a leatherback. Now, these fisheries are regulated with quotas. So typically what would happen in the during the year is like, they may pay attention to this, they may not, but if they start getting close to a quota, yeah, this, this little tool becomes pretty important in terms of helping them avoid interacting with leatherbacks, essentially creating, reducing the overlap between the fish and the turtles. Another way to, to exploit um, a, uh, a separation in space is in a vertical dimension. And so this is a new fishery that's been uh, occurring off the California coast called the deep set buoy gear fishery. In this case, we're, we've got leatherbacks up here at the surface, an air breather, and swordfish at depth during the daytime. And so by having your gear at the bottom of this, of this deep set uh, stuff here, in this case, we're down to about 800 feet down, you can exploit this separation in a vertical dimension, catch your swordfish and avoid catching leatherbacks. This is another way to uh, reduce fishery interactions. But the leatherback is a, what we call an extreme uh, transboundary species. The California current is probably the, the safest place in the whole Pacific Ocean for a leatherback. Thanks to the laws that we've enacted and the regulations and the innovation of our fishers. But we, this has to be carried out at a much larger scale if we're going to see recovery of the population. This is an example showing uh, data that we got from trans, putting transmitters on turtle and overlaying them in areas where fishing effort, in this case, longline fishing effort was occurring. All those little lines that you see out here, those little bubbles, those are all the exclusive economic zones of various countries throughout the Pacific. And the bottom line here is you can see in the, especially in the warmer colors are areas where the probability of interacting with a fishery is greatest. And it's really concerning, particularly right adjacent to the nesting beach. That's, if there's gonna be, you know, um, a marine protected area, for instance, that's gonna be addressing leatherbacks, it'd probably have to be off the, the nesting beaches because I don't see how you're going to create a, a marine protected area that spans the whole expanse of the Pacific Ocean. It would be pretty difficult. And then in this picture here, it shows you kind of what you're really up against. This is an image that shows three months of fishing effort. And it's kind of hard to see here. I've put Hawaii on here just to put a, a marker for you. San Diego would be up here. Down here is New Guinea, the nesting areas. And all this light out here, those are all fishing vessels just during three months of fishing effort during in 2019. So the yellows are foreign, foreign boats, the pinks are US boats. You can see we've created these um, uh, protected areas, if you will, around the Hawaiian Islands and some of the US territories out here in the Pacific where we don't uh, permit fishing. But you can see what a, what a crowd it is out there, how much fishing effort is really going on with this image. Um, it's really quite dramatic, actually. So we need to be working with other nations and what we call regional fishing, fishing management organizations. And so essentially the Pacific Ocean has been divided in half by the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission and the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission. And essentially what they're responsible for is for managing the fishery. So they're mostly interested in not making sure they don't over harvest things like big eye tuna or yellowfin tuna or bluefin tuna, those kinds of things. They don't really do much uh, action when it comes to um, trying to address the bycatch of species, whether it be turtles or marine mammals for that matter. So 
So these RFMOs have to be engaged. They're, they were set up by the United Nations. Um, they, in contrast to our longline fishery uh, that's out in Hawaii, that has 100% observer coverage in the sallow set, sallow set longline fishery, these guys here are in the single digits with regards to observer coverage. So we need much better engagement with these RFMOs. And also we need to address what's called uh, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing. Otherwise what I call pirate fishing. So in these areas, um, they're a leading cause of global overfishing. And it often involves forced labor, human trafficking, and other human rights abuses. So if you if you're not if you're not really too motivated about bycatch of leatherback turtles or other protected species, you might want to pay attention to this because of what's happening here. Now, recently, just as a matter of fact, on yesterday, today's what today's Tuesday or Wednesday, I can't remember. On Monday, um, the president actually signed a bill to address IUU fishing. And uh, John Kerry right now is over in Portugal at the ocean conference, uh, World Ocean Conference to address this kind of stuff and get support from other nations to address IUU fishing. It's a, it's a big problem and they're really trying to crack down on this. We also have to be engaging with what we call artisanal fisheries. These are small scale fishing fishers um, that are located on the coastline, usually small villages, lots of times people almost starving in these places that are going out and putting small nets in the water to try to catch something to eat. Um, so what has been turned out to be helpful lately is using lights to illuminate these gill nets by these artisanal fisheries. Um, this is, requires a real grassroots effort. You're not gonna be able to address this usually through other governments, Usually these countries have pretty weak central governments. Um, so you're actually engaging with folks at a very regional or a village, some the village level sometimes. Additionally, you can use other, other things, other tools, for instance, in, in um, industrial scale fishings like uh, mitigation technologies like circle hooks. I hear this guy's taking a hook out of a leather back with this, this tool here. Um, you can train folks to safely release leatherback turtles and um, maybe even better not catch them in the first place. So here's one, here's another example of something that can be done uh, going forward throughout the Pacific Ocean, which is to change the design of, of hooks and, and use alternatives in bait. So what we've got here on the top, these, this, is a, this is a circle hook. This is a classic J style hook. And a, a, there's a Japanese tuna hook here. I've pulled these J style hooks out of leatherbacks at the nesting beach from time to time. And the idea behind this is that leatherbacks particularly don't, aren't going after bait. And in this case, they actually switched from a squid bait to a mackerel bait and they completely left it alone, but they still get hooked. They get snagged. They got those big flippers, they get snagged. And with a circle hook, that's less likely to happen than it is with a J hook. And then this figure down here shows what happened with the Hawaii fishery. So this is bycatch of leatherback turtles and loggerheads from the 1990s throughout through 2001. And what happened here in the middle was that they went over the quota. So they shut down the fishery. Now, one bad, one bad outcome of that was that that effort ended up being transferred to foreign fleets and we ended up buying that stuff from foreign fisheries, even though they were not engaged in safe practices with regards to leatherbacks. Nevertheless, when the Hawaii fishery came back online and they were started using circle hooks and using uh, mackerel bait instead of squid, we see much lower levels of bycatch. Now, this can be replicated throughout the Pacific if we can get some agreement to use better types of technology and technology that has been proven at least in our own fisheries. But there's always gonna be some resistance to these things, particularly in a cultural way that maybe you're not going to have the same kind of catch that you would before, but that hasn't been the case with our Hawaiian fishery. They're doing quite well um, with regards to catching swordfish and tuna. And this, this alone 
would make a real big difference for leatherback recovery. Next, enhanced nesting beach protection and reproductive output. Here is the, the trend from the nesting beaches showing this 78% decline over 27 years of the nesting beaches. Um, about 1,300 adult females remain. The IUCN projection is that there'll be a 96% decline by 2040. That's an even worse situation in the Eastern Pacific. Um, about 750 adult females remaining, 100% decline projected by 2040. So what we have to do here is engage folks there at these nesting beaches to protect these areas uh, for leatherbacks. And so um, one of the things that you might hear a lot about is li about light pollution. So areas that have development, whether it's resorts or houses at the beach, that can be detrimental for leatherback nesting. Now you can mitigate this. I was just over in, in Florida uh, about a month ago at Juno Beach. They've got high rises down there on the beaches. They've got all kinds of stuff, but everyone's bought into it. It's dark. It's red lights. It's dark. All kinds of turtles are coming up there, leatherbacks, loggerheads. So it can work as long as people would cooperate. Um, it can work quite often. Um, so coastal development is, is an issue, particularly in the Eastern Pacific. Um, there is some poaching that continues in some areas, but for the most part, uh, the governments of Mexico and Costa Rica have responded to that. The Western Pacific's a different, little, little different. And uh, part of that has to do with their culture and lifestyle. So no roads, no airports, everything has to move by ocean. You see this guy's actually carving out a canoe for himself up here. This, this little structure here is known as a man house. And that was used sometime in the past to have Young men, as they're coming into manhood, they would go in the man house. One of their jobs was to go out on the beach, collect the eggs, and bring them back to the community where they would divvy them up among the folks in the community. They've lived with leatherbacks for generations, and their numbers at those villages have never been high enough to ever have any impact on leatherback turtle nests. But the, this, is, this is a subsistence culture. So they say no roads, no planes, no store. Um, they hunt and they garden, and but they still have needs. And you can see here that, you know, no lack of transportation and access, limited schools, no electricity. This is an impoverished area. And they want the same things that we want. They want education. They want improved housing. They're no different from us. It's just that these, we need, they're just in an impoverished situation. So we need to figure out a way to incentivize community participation through alternative livelihood programs. And we have colleagues now that are doing that at the State University of Papua, teaching them to increase their, their uh, yields on some of their uh, crops, cacao, things like that. Um, they're even starting to hunt some of the pigs and sell the meat, which is a great idea. Because in the end, it, we need to show them that they need to know that they benefit from conservation. If we just do the conservation by itself, it's not gonna work. These, these folks are struggling. So they're engaged in the activities of the beaches now. They are doing things to control and eliminate predators and, and introduce vegetation. Relocating what we call doom nests. So down here on the bottom, you see this is some beach erosion and it's exposed these eggs. We know, they know where this beach erosion is gonna occur. So they can move eggs like this to areas like this little hatchery over here that are gonna have a much greater likelihood of, of successful hatching. There's an electric fence that was put up to keep the pigs out as another example. So they are involved in mitigating some of the uh, things that reduce hatching success at these beaches. And of course, they've also stopped eating eggs and killing adult animals. The international cooperation, as I mentioned before, um, this is gonna require a concerted effort on behalf of everybody around the Pacific Ocean if we're going to maintain leatherback turtles in the Pacific Ocean. We just can't protect things in California and think it's gonna work out. So everybody has to get involved, including these RFMOs that I mentioned before. And this means enhanced observer programs and addressing IUU fishing and seafood fraud. 
We still consume a lot of swordfish in the United States. Um, this figure here shows that the import volume as a percent of consumption is pretty hot, it's still been pretty steady. Nevertheless, the consumption itself in just terms of tonnage is going down and US imports are, have been going down, but still we consume a lot because we, our fisheries in Hawaii and off the East Coast and off California cannot satisfy the demand, the domestic demand for swordfish. So we have to import it. The United States is the world's second largest importer of seafood. So anyway, consumption, uh, fish, well, I'm gonna come back to this in just a little bit. Um, action item number four is the part that I'm engaged in really, which is the monitoring. And so we're engaged in this monitoring effort here in California and off the US West Coast, but we need to do, do the same kind of things over in the South China Sea or enable others build capacity over there so they can do this kind of stuff so they can inform their, their folks over there about the best way to use their resources and avoid interacting with endangered species. Um, so other kind of questions coming out of this, like <laughs> this hatchling on the bottom reminds me that, you know, for the most part, sea turtles, we don't know very much about them after they leave the, the nesting beach. I mean, the program we have here on the West Coast with monitoring these foraging areas is unique. There's, there's a couple uh, going on on the East Coast of the United States. Nobody else in the Pacific is doing this. And as a consequence, we kind of term the time from the, the when a leatherback leaves the beach as a hatchling until it comes back as an adult as the lost years. But we don't know where they go. We don't know how many are going to survive. So that is really an area that needs to be um, in, you know, investigated further and much more resources put into solving the riddles of the lost years where these small hatchlings go and how fast that they grow, what their likelihood of survival is. And need to continue to replenish and revamp these dynamic movement models to inform management as well, whether it be fishers or recently we're getting lots of requests from the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management because of some of the wind energy things that they're gonna be putting in the ocean here soon. So that's, what, that's where these data go for these monitoring efforts. And then there's public engagement. And in this case here, we'd like you to let us know if you ever see a leatherback, we can really use that information. I've got a couple of email addresses here. Um, the first one might be a little bit hard to remember, but mine's pretty easy. You can just email me directly at scott.benson at noaa.gov. That was really a great thing that NOAA did. They made that pretty straightforward. Um, try to keep the garbage out of the ocean. Um, it's you probably hear a lot about leatherbacks eating or sea turtles eating uh, plastic. Um, I'm not sure how if it's a it's a real big cause of mortality. Although we have seen in this figure down here, um, the incidence of plastic or marine debris in the GI tract of leatherbacks going up since about the 1950s, coincidentally with the rise of plastics. So it doesn't necessarily mean this is the cause of death for all these animals, but um, uh, it's definitely a concern that they ingest this stuff. And more than likely though, they're likely to get entangled in this gear. So this, like this gear here, this is the net monster it was found inside a dead sperm whale that stranded in uh, from San Francisco, I believe. That thing is about 10 to 12 feet high. So all that stuff was inside the sperm whale. So, Again, this is just another way of saying we've really got to keep the garbage out of the ocean so that these animals don't interact with it. To make responsible seafood choices, this is a biggie. And this is one of the ways where the public at large can be engaged. And that is to find out where your seafood is coming from. And it's not an easy thing to do, but you've got to try. And so in this figure here, I'm just showing that Hawaii tuna comes potentially at a cost of one turtle. You get down here to the bottom, China tuna, 19 turtles. So the United States is unique. We have the Endangered Species Act. We have the Marine Mammal Protection Act. These things are not common currency across the Pacific Ocean. And so you'd be, you're better off buying US seafood that comes with a side dish of the Endangered Species Act than buying foreign seafood that comes with a side dish of dead dolphin or dead turtle. Um, 
our fisheries are highly regulated and very innovative and then come with a markedly lower bycatch. Now it's not always easy to do. I mean, Monterey, the Monterey uh, Bay Aquarium makes it pretty straightforward for us is that, yeah, um, avoid imported swordfish, but US swordfish is a good alternative. But it's not always an easy thing to do because of the way globalization has affected fisheries across the, the world. So recently with this conflict, for instance, in um, Ukraine, the United States wanted to ban all kinds of fish that are coming out of Russia. Now, Russian caught pollock, salmon, and crab are still likely to enter the United States by way of China. So like the US seafood industry, Russian companies rely heavily on China to process their catch. Once there, the seafood can be re-exported to the United States as a product of China. So as a result, you know, China doesn't catch cod, they don't catch pollock, yet they're one of the largest exporters of these whitefish around the world. <laughs> and some of our product ends up like that as well. It's because we don't have places that process seafood here in the United States anymore. We feel like we have to, in my opinion, exploit cheap labor overseas, send the product back and forth a few times, it's caught, it's processed, it's sent back to us um, because people have decided over time that it's just too expensive to process that stuff here. And I, I, I think that's something that needs to be reconsidered. We can't continue to farm out our, our problems to others and expect not to have any cost associated with it. There is a cost. Um, when I was an observer on tuna boats back in the 1980s, we had canneries in San Diego and Long Beach, places like that. We could have those again. We just have to pay people a living wage to do it, but we'd be far better off if we did it that way than the way we're doing it right now. Leatherback turtles are ocean ambassadors. They connect countries across the Pacific and cultures across the Pacific. They're very unique animals. They've been around for 80 million years. They deserve to stay. And as a biologist, it's kind of a, a little bit, I get depressed sometimes to be honest with you, uh, looking at this whole thing, um, trying to figure out how to do this. And uh, this, um, how to square this way. And this quote from Jay Barlow, who many of you may know, he's a pretty well, world-renowned marine mammal biologist. Um, I'm just gonna read this one part at the top. Alone research cannot save the species, only the concerted work of NGOs, governments, and a groundswell of public support can do this. But what we as scientists and educators can do is shine a light to help illuminate the most pressing problems. And so he said this in the context of the Yangtze River dolphin. We have an important role to play in preserving the species we study, let's play it. So that's my credo. I, 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 when I get depressed about it, I, I look at this kind of thing and say, okay, hang in there, keep fighting the good fight. Um, but obviously to really affect change and enhance recovery prospects, everybody around the Pacific Ocean needs to be engaged. If you wanna know more about leatherback turtles, I, I, you could look at some of these websites. There was a, a fairly recent review of uh, a global uh, review of the global global review excuse me of leatherback turtles that was published in 2020 we also have some uh, videos and things like that online at these websites you can see here um, and that's all I've got for today uh, gladly take your questions oh and in the meantime while I'm taking your questions uh, I thought maybe we could play a video. Uh, this is raw video that I got from uh, putting a camera on the carapace of a leatherback turtle off of San Francisco back in 20, this one's from 2017. So let's see if this works for you. You got the video going? Yes, Can you see it's it? going, yes. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> How quickly do you think this turtle is moving? That right now, since it's foraging, it's probably only moving about a couple kilometers, you know, an hour, not very mm -hmm. fast. Now, they're capable of doing some pretty short uh, bursts. 
Um, and when they're starting their migration, they're going to do probably around 50 miles a day. So they can they can put some distance in definitely. But when they're foraging, they're not moving really extremely fast. And you can see by the light in the water that that animal is not very deep either. Mm -hmm. It's only about, it's kind of just essentially lurking beneath the surface at about 10 meters or so. Excellent. All right. This will, this will be a great accompaniment to our questions. Um, Bob, do you want to take a look at the questions that we have? I do. And uh, uh, Scott, you um, uh, did such a good job. We didn't get a lot of questions. Uh, but uh, they're going to be interesting, the ones you get. The first one was, um, uh, was anything special noted during the blob? Remember the 2014 to 16 marine heat wave that we had? Well, not really by myself, because I've learned over time that research dollars are scarce. Uh, and when we've in the past had an El Nino come in, we had less turtles around. So one thing I didn't show you here today was that in the past, we noticed a relationship between upwelling strength and abundance of jellies or turtles. So in years we have strong upwelling, jellyfish are abundant, and hence we got lots of leatherbacks on the coast. In poor upwelling years, it's the opposite. And so we had this nice uh, relationship between strength of upwelling and leatherback. So when I see something coming like an El Nino, when I didn't, when I have very few research dollars, I'm not gonna propose going out there and trying to do this work because although it's interesting for, to me as a scientist, funders aren't usually very satisfied to, to learn that you spent their money, went out on the ocean, but didn't see anything. And so I, I did not do anything during the blob years. I, I can tell you that um, there were less jellies during the blob time um, and that the habitat compressed for certain, but its impact on leatherbacks for me is, is largely unknown. Now, here's another one that's gonna be a tough one because it's pretty broad. And I think it relates to uh, priority three and it is, is it known what steps the nations would take to stop or prevent the illegal fishing or abuse of rights? Yeah, they, they need to be they need to be tracing the product better. So what happens with these IUU fisheries is that they are staying out to sea for years. I mean, again, these folks are it is forced labor situations. They're staying out to sea for years and they're transshipping the product from one boat to another. And having that go into the into a, a place to offload it, so there needs to be uh, regulations, if you will, that when a some something is offloaded in a location, we know where it came from. Um, and in this case, I think something like blockchain technology might actually be useful to do this. Right, here's a, a general one regarding a, a feeding. Um, about three parts to it. And is how do leatherbacks find their food? Is it through smell, water, temp, current time of year? Do they intentionally fast? And what do hatchlings eat? Okay, that, all, all good questions. So leatherbacks do have a good sense of smell and I'm sure that they're able to use their olfactory capabilities to zero in on stuff. Visually though, we can see like in this video that they are actually using uh, vision often to silhouette a jellyfish that's at, above them to catch them that way. The little turtles, yeah, they're after small, small gelatinous zooplankton. And um, they're kind of at the mercy of good luck, um, particularly when they're really small and not really very strong swimmers. They're going to get infected out to areas of the ocean. They're going to carry some resources with them as soon as they leave the beach, as leftover, if you will, from being in an egg. So a little bit of that uh, a little bit of that uh, protein that way, but that only lasts them for about five days. And then after that, they better hope that they're in a place where there's some other things to eat, otherwise they'll just starve. And that's probably what happens to most of them is they, they, they end up starving because they can't find resources. So here's a, here's a good question. How do they swallow food and not get water either fill up their stomach or in their lungs? 
Well, they have a way of not getting water into their lungs through a, a glottis, essentially, in the esophagus, but they do swallow a lot of salt water. And what they've got are a, um, a, uh, a gland right near the eyes that helps extract uh, salt. And when you see that at the nesting beach, it looks kind of gross maybe because it gets all caked up with sand and things like that. And people say funny things like, oh, the turtle's crying because she knows she'll never see her babies. But what it is, is it's, it's uh, extracting salt. And in some of these videos, We've talked about this in the past that um, you can see that 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 salt gland doing its action with that kind of slime coming out of the side of the eye. <coughs> and people have asked, <coughs> is it possible that that thing is also helping the turtle avoid getting stung by a jellyfish? I, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, is there any uh, current uh, pending legislation, either state or federal, uh, that uh, addresses or might help leatherbacks? That, uh, that we're, we could do something with? I, I think I, what I think needs to happen is that we have to put everybody on a level playing field. So we have to um, demand from our elected folks that the same kind of regulations that we have on our domestic fisheries, that, that, same kind of, that, that those same kind of safeguards have to apply to anything that we import. Um, it, it's got to be a level playing field, and there's got to be some way to demonstrate that that's in fact what's happening, whether it's through observer programs or, um, you know, VMS monitoring, things like that. Um, that's probably the number one thing I think could be done because our fisheries in the United States have demonstrated they can do it. So if we're going to import this stuff, it's got to be at the same level. If you can't get to that level, then you don't get access to our markets. It's that straightforward. And it, that would potentially make swordfish less abundant in the United States, hence it would become more expensive. But let's face it, swordfish is not feeding the world. Um, it's not, you know, it, it's really kind of a rich man's item, rich man's lunch. Um, and hence why we import so much of it compared to other nations. Um, so I think that's what you have to do is, is kind of demand that the same kind of regulations that we have on our domestic fisheries are the same as we, we demand the same of the stuff that gets imported from elsewhere. Okay, here's one about eggs. How, uh, how so many eggs get formed at once? It's obviously different from like birds. Uh, what's the physiological process? I don't know. I, 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 there's, there's, there's quite a bit about leather pack biology. I still don't know, but you could ask somebody who knows there, there would be, you could probably look it up. Yes. All right. That's all right. Now I noticed this as well, that in the opening, your, your title slide, uh, you've got a, um, a net out there to catch a leatherback and that net looks smaller than the leatherbacks. So the question is, how do you catch leatherbacks at sea to tag them and bring them in the boat? And, and how long do they stay up at the surface where you can, you know, where they're visible? Okay, the, the second one first, they're at the surface for about um, a couple minutes, maybe as much as four, sometimes four minutes at the surface, that would be a long interval. Um, to catch them, you have to have a really good boat handler. And I've got one in John Douglas over at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. Um, we essentially sneak up on the turtle from behind. Don't let it, it we don't let it know it's, that we're there. And we get it kind of right on the front corner of the vessel on the right side. And I put that hoop net down. The net essentially breaks away from the structure of the hoop itself. So it becomes a bag. And so the turtle is essentially in a bag and that's how we, we are able to you know, get it initially. And then we bring it over the side of the boat and I put ropes on it and things like that. And that vessel is a very unique vessel. It's like a small landing craft. So the bow door will actually come down and we can essentially slide the animal into the boat and then up into the, uh, up inside the boat. And we've got, you know, PVC plating on it to prevent abrasions and keep the animal safe and, and unharmed. 
It's good because it was a good question. Like, how would you ever lift one of those guys into your boat? So that's a good answer. <laughs> well, and you know what? We, we you know, with Bumpy, um, the first time we caught Bumpy, I had suspended doing any more uh, weighing of turtles because it was taking so long. We we had a system to, you know, hoist them up on a, on a lift. And um, I determined that it was potentially if impacting some of the movements after they got in the water, meaning that they would respond to being handled by running away quite, you know, quite quickly after we put them in the water. So I suspended weigh, weighing them anymore until this last year where we got this nice relationship with this um, NGO Upwell. They bought us a livestock scale and we actually have that on the deck of the vessel. And so when we caught Bumpy the second time, we were able just to slide him up on top of this thing and get a weight. And he weighed over 1,460 pounds. That's the <laughs> biggest one we've ever caught. <laughs> Here's another uh, technology question, which is, uh, um, you know, you use aerial surveys, uh, uh, you know, but airplanes are expensive. Have you considered using drones? <laughs> yeah, we have. And uh, we, we were doing that last year. Um, it was like looking for something in the dark with a flashlight. Um, it, uh, it, it, I think that technology uh, is has some promise for the future, but right now I'm I'm pretty skeptical. I don't think you could you know find one. They found they found molas, but they're super abundant. They even found jellies, but you know they're very abundant. But you're looking for something that's rare and cryptic, and it's not traveling in a school or anything like that. Uh, it um, it we're going to try it again this summer, but I'm much happier having our manned aircraft team. They got four, three to four people in a plane, so that you know several pairs of eyes. And you know when they're doing a circle for something, they have to do a wider circle. They're seeing a much larger area. They're much more effective at finding uh, leatherbacks. But that technology with the drones will improve, and I'm going to keep an open mind in the meantime. Well, thank you. You've answered all of the questions that have been uh, that have been asked, and uh, I'll turn it over to uh, to Gail. Thank you so much, Scott. We really appreciate your time and all of this wonderful information. Um, just for the group, if you are interested in some of the email addresses um, that actually there were two email addresses that Scott provided that you could submit um, any information about sightings of these magnificent creatures um, in the chat. So have a look at that. Um, and also the recording of this video will be made available on our website and um, on YouTube in within roughly a week. Um, so if you want to go back and pull any information um, like the, the website listings that were at the close of the deck, um, that will all be available in the video very soon. So thank you so much for your time. We hope you enjoyed you. this. Well, thank you. Like I said, it, it's really, um, you know, uh, it's always an opportunity I'm going to take to present things like this to the public at large. Um, you know, writing papers between ourselves, you know, to our peers, um, you know, this is the common currency we use in science is to write papers for journals and things like that. But actually being able to speak to the public at large that really has a much larger role in this than we do as researchers is very important to me so i really appreciate the opportunity thank you it's our great pleasure thank you scott and thanks everyone for joining hope to see you at our future events have a good night <laughs>